Fantastic. Well, I'm Travis Steffens uh, here uh, with Exploring by the Cedar Pants, and it is my absolute privilege to introduce um, a friend of mine, George Karunas, um, who I had the privilege of uh, heading down to Madagascar with and doing some adventures. Um, but we also have a bunch of classrooms with us. I'll, 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 I'm going to uh, do the class intros first, and then I'll introduce George. Um, and I think everyone here is in, in for a really amazing talk. So let's see. I think we have... Uh, Mrs. O'Connor's group yeah. might be here. Yeah, we're here. Wonderful. Hi. They're coming all the way from uh, Thunder Bay, so that's fabulous. Uh, what do we got here? We probably have uh, Mrs. Diesel's class. Yay! Wonderful. All the way from Brantford, Ontario. That's fantastic. Mrs. O'Neill's class down in Texas. Yay! All right. That's a good Texas Texas cheer there. <laughs> see, we got Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Cowley's class in Sarnia, Ontario. Yay! Yay! Fantastic. And there might be one more class joining, um, Mrs. Shaw from Bar Barrie, uh, Ontario. Sounds like we got a, a large representation here in Ontario, and of course some Texans down south. So we got all of North America here to to listen to George. Um, George here, I'll put his picture on so you can see him as I talk. George, George is quite an amazing guy. I've been had the privilege of getting to know him, but he's a renowned global adventurer, storm chaser, explorer, and television presenter. Based here in Toronto, his efforts to document nature's worst weather conditions have taken him all over the globe into places most normal people are fleeing from. Whether it's a tornado outbreak in Kansas, a monster hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, forest fires in British Columbia, or even an erupting volcano somewhere on this planet, he's um, usually in the middle of the action with his camera rolling. He loves to share the awesome power of the planet with people around the world, and he's just recently re returned from an expedition to Benbow Crater in Vanuatu, um, where he got up close and personal with only one or one of only a handful of lava lakes on the planet. And I, I saw some uh, uh, early footage of this, and it was amazing. So welcome, George, and uh, I'll let you take it over from here. Awesome. Thank you very much, Travis. It's, uh, it's, it's good to see you. <laughs> and hello to all you guys out there in, in Ontario and, and Texas. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you guys. This is the second time I've done one of these exploring by the seat of your pants, and I really enjoy them a lot. Uh, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Yeah, okay, awesome. So, yeah, as Travis was saying, it's basically my job to travel all over the world, document the most extreme places, and then share what I've seen with as many people as possible. So whenever you're watching television and you see a nature documentary on National Geographic or on Discovery Channel or something like that, and there's, there's videos of volcanoes erupting or tornadoes touching down or hurricanes, it's a good chance that a lot of that footage that you see is mine. So my travels have taken, uh, taken me to about 60 different countries on every single continent from Antarctica to Greenland, from Madagascar to Turkmenistan and, and every spot in between. And uh, the, the thing that I love so much is just seeing nature at its most extreme. So basically, <laughs> if there's some force of nature that's dangerous and, and, is, and most people are running away from, I'm the guy that's going the other direction straight towards it. And what I want to share with you guys specifically today is my latest expedition to the South Pacific, uh, to a place called Ambram Island. And it is uh, just an amazing place with one of the world's most active volcanoes. And when I say active, it is very active. Let me pull a screen share up here so I can show you some pictures and such. See if I can get this to work. This should work now if I go here. Is that showing up? Oh. There we go. Yeah, it looks good. You can see that? Okay, great. So this is a lake of lava. It's Imagine just a regular lake, like you would maybe go up to the cottage or something and just relax at, but instead of water, it's boiling hot rock that's 2,000 degrees, churning away just 24 hours a day, all day long. And there's uh, not too many places in the world that have these things, and they're very difficult to get to. They're in very remote areas, and of course... <laughs> 
they can be pretty dangerous as well. So this particular one is in the country of Vanuatu. Most people have never heard of this country. There it is right there. It's uh, just to the east of Australia. It's a small island nation. There's about 80 islands or so that make up this uh, archipelago of volcanic islands. And there's numerous uh, active volcanoes on this country. And uh, Ambram, which is the island that has this particular volcano that I just came back from, is this guy right here in the middle. And uh, it's, it's a pretty big island. Not a lot of people live there, though. It's very remote and very basic. So the island itself is full, filled with jungle, except for the very center. The center of this island is nothing but this... It looks like the surface of the moon. There's nothing living there. It's all just volcanic ash, gray, with these craters in the middle of the, uh, of the island there. And so that's where I decided to go to. This was my third expedition going to this particular island. And it's a dangerous place. The red that you see is all the danger zone. So every now and then this volcano has the, the um, <laughs> has a bad temper and it decides to explode every now and then. So you don't want to be there when it has one of its explosive eruptions. And right now it's not, which is good. It's, it's having a more gentle eruption. It's sort of slowly releasing all of its energy continuously right now, which makes it a little bit safer, <laughs> a little bit. But uh, the red area where the crater is, is the high hazard area. That's where we were. And then you can see around the edges of the island, you've got some areas that are sort of low hazard, medium hazard, and then some of the higher hazards as well. And those red lines coming out from the middle, those are the river valleys. If you have a big volcanic explosion, a lot of that volcanic ash and these pyroclastic flows of hot gas and rocks will flow down the river valleys. So if you happen to live in a village that's near one of these, if you see this little pl place called Endu over on the far right, that's one of the villages that I visited. It sort of is in one of these river valleys. So if the volcano decides to have a, a big eruption, they'd be potentially in a lot of trouble. But uh, it is a beautiful place. If you were to look down from the International Space Station and, and see this island, you could see the green jungle. There's the Pacific Ocean surrounding it. And there are two craters that are active on this volcano. One is named Marum, which is the one on the right. You can see it sort of smoking away there. And then the one on the left is called Benbo. And I've been to the bottom of both of these guys now. And this particular expedition was to the Benbo crater. And it produces a lot of volcanic gas. Things like carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide is an interesting gas. When you smell it, it kind of smells like that smell when you light a like a when you light a match that sulfurous kind of smell i'm sure you've all smelled that before and that gas combines with any rain that falls and turns it into acid rain very very strong acid rain so if you have this rain landing on you it will actually burn your skin and sting your eyes and rust anything that's metal that you have things like tent poles cameras anything that's metal will instantly almost instantly rust and so to get to this uh, very remote spot, we had to take a helicopter. Of course, helicopters are a lot of fun to ride around in. And there's the chopper taking off after dropping off all of our equipment. So this was going to be our home for the next week. And uh, basically just a big pile of gear. And we had to build our structure where we lived. There's the chopper dropping off uh, some a wooden structure that became our main our main tent and there I am getting blown by the downwash of this helicopter. If you've uh, ever had the chance to ride in one of these you'll uh, you'll understand how much fun helicopters can be. They don't really fly, they sort of beat the air until they <laughs> until they rise up. They're, it's just brute force. They're really quite wonderful. And of course we're setting up inside the crater. You can sort of see the edges of the crater walls there. So that shows to me that I, Years ago, at some point, there was a very large explosion that created this giant crater that we're now camping in. And that's how we built our shelter. So there I am getting ready to uh, continue digging away, and that was going to be our home for a week. It doesn't look like much, but uh, let me tell you, at nighttime, when you get the glow from the lava, it, uh, it really turns from this sort of <laughs> what looks like just a bunch of tarps on some wood you know, it, it ends up being really, really beautiful at night. And that's part of the reason why I love going to these places, is just to show people how beautiful it is. It's hard to get to, so most people don't get the chance to go here. But 
the beauty is amazing. At night, the fog would just be lit up by this glow from the lava nearby. And at this point, we haven't even gone inside the main crater yet. We're just seeing the glow. So at this point, we know that the volcano is very active. We could hear the lava churning away. We could see the glow at night, but we hadn't seen it with our own eyes yet. So there's part of the team. We're getting ready to go down inside the crater. And uh, to do this, we need special rope climbing equipment. And uh, getting down is sort of the easy part. Getting back up is really tricky. So we had these gasoline-powered rope uh, ascenders we would use. It's kind of like a little lawnmower engine that you thread the rope through, and it helps to pull you up, kind of like your own little personal elevator. So those are really cool. Uh, but of course, we had to be very careful with them because any metal that gets in contact with the rain there rusts because of the acid rain. So a lot of caution we ha was something we have to take because of uh, the dangers there. This is not a it's not a place you want to spend a lot of your lifetime because it's very dangerous. But what we did is we uh, we waited for a clear day when there was no rain, and then hiked up the side of the inner crater. You can see it there on the right, and then we finally got our first view of the inside of the crater. And there it is, massive, this great big hole in the ground, and about 200 meters or about 200 yards down, there is this orange lake of lava that is just boiling away and you can see the gas cloud coming out of that. Every now and then of course the wind would blow that gas cloud towards us and we'd have to wear special gas masks to protect us from that sulfur gas because it, it does burn your lungs. It basically turns the fluid in your lungs into acid. So you, as you can imagine that's probably not very good for you. So we would wear gas masks whenever we had to uh, encounter this gas cloud. But luckily on this day, the wind is blowing the gas away from us, so we got really lucky. We got a really good view of the lava down at the bottom. But of course, we wanted to get all the way down there, so that required a little bit of extra work. Over here on the right, you can see these that yellow and blue bag. That is our anchor where the ropes are all attached. And now we're getting ready to rappel down to the bottom. It's kind of like climbing Mount Everest, but in reverse. Instead of going up and then climbing back down, here we start with the down part and then finish with coming up. So it's, it's a little more tricky. Oh, yeah, plus there's hot lava inside, <laughs> which you don't obviously you know, have that on uh, Mount Everest. So here we are, ready to go. There's me on the left, my friend Brad and, uh, and Chris on the right. Got the GoPro camera stuck to my head. I'll show you guys a video clip in a couple of minutes. We're all harnessed up, got our climbing equipment ready to go, and now we're getting ready to drop down. There it is, on the way down. This is less than halfway down. The biggest danger is not actually the lava so much, but it's the falling rocks. There's so many loose rocks that the rope ends up hitting and knocking loose, or your buddy is climbing above you and his boot will hit a rock and it'll come tumbling down on top of you. So a lot of the time we've got the helmets on with a face shield to help protect if any uh, rocks come down to hit you in the face, which, you know, that'll ruin your day pretty quickly. And we actually had one guy have a rock sort of fall on his leg and he was injured the day before. He still made it down to the bottom, but we found out later on after he got home that his leg was actually broken. So he went down to the bottom of this crater and back out with a broken leg. That guy was amazing. If you look really, really closely on the right side, you might see a person. Take a close look. See that white rock over by the right side? There's a person there. That gives you an idea of the size of this lake of lava. Let me zoom in a little bit to show you guys a little closer. There he is. So that's one of my friends there, one of my colleagues. Let me zoom back out so you can get a better look. This is a very, very huge crater. So it's kind of hard to tell how big something is, how far away things are. So it can be a little tricky. It creates this optical illusion effect because there's nothing there for scale. It's when you see a person in the picture, that's when you fully realize how big these rocks are and how large this crater actually is. So now I've made it down to the bottom, and now you can see that we've got this lava that is exploding up in these fountains of liquid hot rock and the waves of heat that are radiating off of this are really hard to describe. If you've ever turned on the oven and been cooking something and you open the door to the oven and that first blast of heat that comes out, you have to be really careful not to burn your face, right? Well this is a similar kind of thing except it's happening all the time and it's created by liquid rock. 
rock. So this particular volcano, there's a chamber of magma. Magma, of course, is lava that has not reached the surface of the Earth. Lava is that molten rock that you can see in the picture that has reached the surface of the Earth. And this chamber of magma is continuously spouting this, this lava that's, that's just shooting straight up in the air. And there are times when it was going up much higher than where I was, so I could look straight across and see these fountains of lava coming up, kind of like a water fountain at a, at a park or something, but liquid hot rock instead that was up in the, in the range of like 2,000 degrees. At any given time, there's about 50 volcanoes around the world that are erupting, and this is one of the ones that does it pretty much continuously. And, of course, that lava is beautiful. It's just brilliant to see, gurgling away. And as the lava flies up in the air, it cools and sort of changes color as it's, as it's arcing through the air. really is beautiful and makes for some spectacular photo opportunities. So, of course, we had to pose for a few pictures in front of the, uh, the churning lava. Now, I could only stand in that place for maybe a few minutes at a time because the heat was just so intense. We would walk over, get into position, get the photos, and then get out of there as quickly as possible. Now, I did bring with me a special heat protective suit. This protects me from the, the radiant heat of that lava. And they're specially designed for people that work in places like steel mills where they're working around liquid metal, very, very hot stuff all day long. So I've got one that I use with me when I bring down into these volcanoes, and that really does help to protect me from that heat. So now I can stand in that spot for quite some time, get some really good photos and video, and be protected from that heat. Of course, if I got splashed by the lava, that would be sort of a different story. No suit is going to protect me from that. But this was the, about uh, as close as you could humanly get. If I were to take a few more steps backwards, I'd end up landing in that lake of lava, and that would ruin your day real quick. And uh, there you can see I'm sweating like crazy. It's so unbelievably hot. Even with the suit on, you're overheating. You can really only wear it for maybe 10 or 15 minutes at a time before you really start to overheat. It's amazing that we live our entire lives on this tiny skin of, uh, of crust on the Earth's surface, and there's so much heat. It's just such an intense uh, heat and pressure, just not very deep below our feet, and there's these few spots around the world where that comes to the surface, and we're able to look into the Earth, kind of like a, a window deep inside the Earth. And uh, it really is, it's an incredible thing to see. Um, we did, of course, oh, I'm going to show you a video here in a second, but uh, I did have the opportunity to have a little bit of fun while we were down there. <laughs> we brought a guitar down with us just for some, just for fun, because we could. We, we went to a lot of effort to go to this spot, so we decided, you know what, let's have a little bit of fun with this and get an awesome rock and roll album cover photo uh, opportunity here while we were down there. So my friend brought this guitar down. We took turns getting photos in front of the uh, of the hot lava with the guitar. And eventually, when it was time to go, we didn't want to carry the guitar up with us. So it ended up getting thrown into the lava, kind of like uh, Frodo throwing the ring into Mount Doom at the end of the Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, so. It was a sacrifice to the volcano at the end of the uh, <laughs> at the end of the expedition. So there you have it. That's sort of what uh, what I do for a living. And uh, this particular expedition was just a tremendous amount of fun. Do you guys want to see a video clip? Check this. Yeah, out. of course. Check this out. Okay. So there we are, looking down inside the crater. We're setting up, Jordan, getting ready. Share your screen again. Oh, hold on. i got to share it again? Yeah. Oh, okay. So that automatically turns off, I guess, when you go back. Bear with me for a second, guys. Entire screen. Share. Can you see that? Yep. All right. Let me start that again here. Here we go. So, some extreme exploration at Benbow Crater. 
There it is. So that's the view from the summit. Looking down, we've got our gas plume coming up. Luckily, it's being blown away from us. Now we're setting up the ropes to drop down inside. And to get down took us quite some time. Just rappelling down on the ropes was maybe an hour and a half to two hours to get down to where the lava is. So it's very difficult. And of course, it takes longer to get back up, working against gravity, of course. And there's no stores, there's no nothing, so we had to bring absolutely everything with us. If we forgot one piece of equipment, we would have been totally stuck. We're on the ropes, getting ready to drop down. So here's a little bit of a time lapse to give you an idea of uh, what it's like to drop down. This will be sped up quite a bit here. Very, very steep. Oh, this, the time lapse is coming up here. There we go. So lots of loose rocks. That's the most dangerous part, actually, is dealing with the loose rocks. Put your foot, your foot, your foot's in the rope. And getting tangled in the ropes. We got very lucky. It rains almost every single day here, and we had a good weather day for uh, for this particular descent. And here we are down at the bottom. You can see those splashes of lava. The walls of the crater are just steaming away. absolutely beautiful. It's hypnotizing just looking at it and watching it. <laughs> this is Benbow Lava Lake, one of several lava lakes here on Ambrum Volcano in Vanuatu. And as is clearly evident, it is very, very active today. Woo! That is hot! places in the world where you can find lakes of lava. This type of volcanic activity is actually quite rare. And uh, it's a real privilege and honor and thrill to be here to witness this up close. The back of my neck is starting to burn. You can see some pieces falling off the crater walls there, dropping back in to get remelted. It's constantly recycling itself. And as the lava comes flying through the air, it starts off bright orange and then cools into this darker color as it flies through the air. You can see in slow motion that cooling effect. Watch this piece coming up here. There we go. Notice how it changes color. It's like being at the beach. But you don't want to go swimming. It's hard to describe how hot lava actually is. It's something that you really have to experience firsthand to really get. I just love these kind of places so much. These spots where Mother Nature is putting on the most amazing show. <laughs> these places are hard to get to, but... All that effort, it's completely worth it. <sighs> Amazing. Ooh. There we go. So you guys can see me again? Travis, can you see me? Yes, sorry, yes, we can. Okay. 
Yep. Okay, cool. I just wasn't sure if this screen share was still on. Yeah. So there you have it. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, uh, my heroes were ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau and Indiana Jones. So I was able to sort of combine those uh, influences and and make a career out of exploration and science and traveling the world and, and uh, helping scientists out. I'm not actually a scientist myself. I uh, studied engineering in school, but what I tend to do frequently is uh, because I have certain skills and ability to go to these very remote and interesting places, I'll quite often assist scientists with getting samples, with getting data from certain really difficult and remote places. Um, I was with Travis about a year and a half ago in Madagascar, and we were mapping these unexplored caves in Madagascar. And I've done things with National Geographic, gathering soil samples from the bottom of a flaming pit in, in Central Asia, looking for extreme bacteria, things like that. So I'm, I'm not a scientist myself, but I love science. I have a scientific mind, and I love to assist scientists uh, by getting samples and data for them that they may not be able to get themselves. So whether it's a tornado or a hurricane or avalanches or caves or volcanoes, if there's something extreme, I'm usually not too far away, usually with the camera rolling, and spend about between 150 to 220 nights per year traveling all over the world. We should let's take some questions, shall we? Yeah, that's awesome, George. Thank you. That was fabulous. I think everyone enjoyed that. I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I'm gonna start with um, our friends down in Texas. Um, actually, we have um, Mrs. Shaw has joined us. Uh, their camera's not on, but let's see if they if they can hear us. Can you hear us, uh, Mr. Sauce class in uh, in uh, where's that in Barry? No. Okay. Well, they're definitely on. So uh, let's see if we can get. Um, well, hopefully they can hear us. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, okay. So Mrs. O'Neill's class. Maybe you have a question. Uh, where, a question. where are you guys? Yeah, in Texas? Yes. I spend a lot of time in Texas when I'm tornado chasing, uh, usually in uh, North Texas or the Texas Panhandle. Where in Texas are you guys? Weatherford. Yeah. Weatherford? I've been to Weatherford. I know exactly where that is. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Woo! All right, Weatherford, what's your question? Where was your first trip to see a volcano? My first trip to see a volcano was in uh, Ethiopia, in eastern Africa. And there's a volcano there called Urta Ale. And it's one of the five in the world that actually has a lake of lava very similar to the one that I was just at. But when I went there, oh boy, was it ever difficult. We had to, we had to drive across the desert in trucks, and then the trucks got stuck in the sand. And then we had to hire locals with camels to tra transport all of our equipment on camels up to the volcano. And when I got there, the lake of lava had crusted over. So I didn't know whether the, the lava was active underneath or not. But I still ended up rappelling down and was walking on top of the crusted lava lake. So that was pretty scary. But uh, obviously, I made it out OK. <laughs> and that was my first ever volcano encounter. And since then, I've been to, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them around the world. And I even got married on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano nine years ago. As lava was flying through the air, it was amazing. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. So let's go to Mrs. Cowley's class um, in Sarnia. Sarnia! Um, do you have a question here? Let's see. Let me just make sure that's on. All right. You're live. Okay. Um, if you touch lava, do you die? What was that? If you touch lava, do you die? If you touch lava, do you die? Well, uh, not necessarily. I've been, I've touched lava many times with special protective gloves and things. I mean, it will, it will burn you. It'll burn you before you touch it, because there's so much heat coming off of the lava that as soon as you get your hand close to it, you'll start to get burned. So with my special heat protective suit, I've actually been able to get up close to lava, pick up pieces of lava. Um, but still burn through my gloves. So it, it is very, very dangerous, but under certain circumstances, you can get very close to it. I was in Hawaii a few years ago, and in Hawaii, at Kilauea Volcano, there are lava flows. So the lava is flowing over the land, 
And at one point, I was able to walk up to one of these lava flows and actually walk on top of the actual lava, setting my boots on fire. And the reason you can do that is because the top layer of that lava flow cools because it's in contact with the air, and it insulates the lava that's inside underneath. So the lava inside is still very liquid while the outside has a crust, and it's dangerous, and I don't recommend you trying it, but you can walk on top of that crust if it's thick enough. Thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful. Um, how about uh, Mrs. O'Connor's class? Let's see if you've got a question for George. All right. Karen, do you want to come in some code? From Thunder Bay. I love Thunder Bay. Hello, my name is Ariana, and my question to you is, have you ever been scared and decided to back out of an adventure? Have I ever been scared and decided to back out of an adventure? Yes, absolutely. Um, you, you cannot be brave without fear, because bravery is not about not having fear, it's about being afraid and going ahead anyway. And fear is actually a good thing. It's there to let me know that I need to take action. Even though I have 20 years of experience doing these kind of things, if I get afraid, that means I need to sort of evaluate what's going on, and it's there to help keep you safe. So there's been many times where I've decided to go to a certain point and then back off because of fear. Right? It's a, it's a good thing to have fear. I, I, I work very closely with fear. Fear is my friend. Fear helps to keep me alive. And I'm very proud to say, in all of these adventures all over the world, I've taken a small boat on a lake of sulfuric acid, and I've had lava flying over my head, and I've, I've videotaped the largest tornado ever documented in the world. And of all of these experiences and, and, and uh, adventures, not a single injury, nothing. Not a broken foot, not a broken finger, nothing. So... Safety is uh, certainly number one, and uh, there's been many, many times where I've been afraid and turned around and ran the other way. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Now, how about uh, Mrs. Diesel from uh, Bradford, Ontario? Do you guys uh, does your class have a uh, have a question for George? Um, how old um were you when you first did your risk? Ah, how old was I when I first started? Wow. Let me think about that. Uh, I actually started kind of late. Uh, when I was young, like you guys, I did a lot of uh, adventures and stuff in my local area. Um, but then uh, in, in my 20s, I uh, was working really hard and, and building a career. And then I switched and decided to go back to my passion of this adventure and, and exploration. So I started chasing tornadoes back oh, when I was about 28 is when I started doing it. So that's a uh, you know a little bit late for doing that kind of thing, but uh, it's been 18 years now of doing it, and uh, and I love it. So if uh, you know, it's you're never too late to start. Fantastic. How about um, we got some time? Maybe if if anyone's interested in another question, um, what about Mrs. O'Neill's class? Do you guys want to ask another question? Yeah, we got time for a few rounds. Where is your next trip going to hopefully be? Ah, I can tell you exactly where my next trip is going to be. It's going to yet another volcano. It's a place called Niragongo, and it's in Central Africa, in the, uh, the country of uh, the Congo. And it's right near the border with Rwanda. That's where the mountain gorillas are. Um, and uh, there's a, it's a very, very big volcano there. It also has a lake of lava. And nearby, there's a city. The city of Goma is very, very close to this volcano. And twice now, in, once in 1977 and once in 2002, a river of lava poured from a crack in the side of the volcano down into the city and actually cut the city in half with this lava flow. So it's a very dangerous volcano. There's a lot of people that live very close to it. And I'm going to go there and help out the scientists who study the volcano. And I'm going to use my skills to help bring those scientists down to the bottom so that they can help study the volcano, learn more about it, and learn more about how they can perhaps predict the next eruption and keep the people in the nearby city of Goma safe. So there's another example of how I'm using what the skills that I've learned to assist other scientists. 
this time in Africa. Wonderful. How about um, Mrs. Cowley's class? Did you, um, did you guys have another question for George? Oh, yeah. Um, when you have your gloves on, what does the lava feel like when it's going through them? <laughs> we know I've got the special heat suit on, right? Yeah. You can still feel the heat, absolutely. The problem with the, with the heat suit is that you get hot from the inside. Imagine wearing a snowsuit on a hot summer's day. Right? Your own body heat is going to heat you up and you're going to start sweating and you're going to overheat. The same thing happens to me when I'm inside the suit. The suit protects me from getting burned from the lava, but it doesn't protect me from getting hot from my own body heat. So you can only wear it for a bit at a time. Now, when you get really close to the lava, it does, I mean, it does help a lot, but they're not really designed to be <laughs> like going right up to lava. No suit is really designed for that kind of thing. And there have been instances where I grab pieces of lava and I'm holding them in my hand. They're, they're cooling, but there's still fire coming off from the, the glove burning in my hand. So you can still feel a lot of the heat. So it provides some protection, but nothing can protect you from such a strong force. Okay. Thank you. Great. How about um, Mrs. O'Connor's class? Uh, do you guys have a, another question? Yes, we do. Sure. Go ahead, Mikhail. Nice. Hello, my name is McKenna. And my, my question is what adventure has been your favorite so far? What adventure has been? Your favorite. My favorite, wow, my favorite adventure. I can tell you, I can tell you right now. Let me, I'm going to pull up an image to show you something. The, um, there's a place in Mexico, cave, that uh, has the largest crystals in the world. And it is an amazing, amazing place. I'm going to pull up a couple of photos to show you. Here we go. Uh, let me get my screen sharing back here. Oh, could you see that? No. no. Hold on. Wait for it. Pull the screen share up. There we go. So now we're sharing, right? Okay. Hold on a second. There. Can you see that? Yeah, that's me in the middle there. And uh, this, this cave is about 900 feet underground, so uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And the crystals inside are made from selenite, which is crystallized gypsum. It's the same material that makes up the drywall in your house. And we were able to go in there for one day, and the temperature is extremely hot. It's 52 Celsius, which is about 126 degrees Fahrenheit, with almost 100% humidity. So it's very, very hot and humid. So the suit that I'm wearing, that orange suit, is actually filled with ice to help keep me cool. And uh, we were able to explore this cave, and it really looks like something from a science fiction movie. It took us about two years to get permission to go here, and we were only in there for about one day. And it is just an amazing, amazing place. It's called Nika, and it is just... its it looks like something from a movie. And that was probably one of my favorite adventures, going to, to that particular place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, does Mrs. Diesel's class have another question? <laughs> Hello. Does your wife ever go on those trips with you? <laughs> Um, not very often, but sometimes she does. We, we got married on an exploding volcano, so she came with me with that, uh, that adventure. And uh, we've been traveling to places like Hawaii and Indonesia together. Um, most of the time, though, she's not uh, too interested in doing that. She has a dog walking company here in Toronto that uh, keeps her very, very busy. I tend to do most of the traveling. And she's not really interested in coming to a lot of the places that I go to. I was in Siberia not too long ago at the coldest town in the world, a place called Oymyakon in, in the frozen wasteland of Siberia. And she wasn't interested in coming with me. I can't figure out why. But when I go to the Bahamas to go d scuba diving, she wants to come with me. So go figure. 
Wonderful. We still have some time. Um, does uh, Mrs. O'Neill's class have any uh, any more questions? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh. Repeat that again. Hi, I'm Lauren. Did you ever find a geode on any of your expeditions? Did I ever find a geode? Um, interesting. That's a really interesting question. I've never actually found a geode, but that crystal cave that I showed you guys the pictures of, that cave is a geode. Imagine a geode the size of a basketball court that you can walk around inside of with the crystals just everywhere. So I haven't really found one, but I've actually been inside of one. And there's not too many places in the world that are that have geodes that you could actually drive a truck into that are that big. Um, so sort of yes and no to answer your question. That's really interesting that you brought that up because, yes, that cave basically is a big um, gypsum geode. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. How about uh, Mrs. Cowley's class? Do you guys have um, another question? Um, has any of your equipment fallen in the lava that you like explored? <laughs> have I ever dropped any of my equipment in the lava? No, but I can give you a story. I was deep in the bottom of a crater one time oh, with one of these... Um, uh, gasoline-powered rope ascenders that I showed you guys earlier. And I was down at the bottom, and it was time to start the motor on it. And I pulled the um, sort of the ignition cable on the motor, and it ripped off right in my hand. And that was my only way of getting out of the crater. Luckily, the engine started on the first pull. And I was able to put my rope through it and able to go up out of the crater, hoping, hoping, hoping that the motor was not going to stall <laughs> during that entire process. And luckily, it didn't. But uh, if, uh, if I had been trapped at the bottom of the crater, luckily, it wouldn't have been that bad because we have to really plan ahead in terms of if, if, there's, gonna be, uh, if there's an accident or a problem. There were other people on the expedition that were at the top of the crater with spare equipment. Um, if uh, anything would have happened, I would have just had to have waited for one of them to come down to help me out. So we always have backup plans. We've always got safety in mind. What do we do if this fails? Okay, if that fails, then what do we do? So there's never any one failure that's going to stop us. The only problem you run into is if you have multiple things failing or some big catastrophic disaster. If the volcano was to decide to have a big explosion, a big eruption, there'd be nothing I could do about it. So what we do is we limit the amount of time that we spend in the extreme danger zone. So we'll go to that extreme danger zone, spend maybe a few moments there, and then get out. The longer you spend, the more likely you are to have an accident. Thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful. What about uh, Mrs. O'Connor's class? Yes, we have another question. Please. I can't really. Okay, Can you okay, back up a little bit, Gabby. Back up a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 You're stepping on each other there. Okay, right there. Go ahead. Um, my name is Gabby, and my question is: Have you ever explored an underwater volcano? Ah, yes. Very interesting. Thanks. It's Gabby, right? I I do a lot of scuba diving. Um, I do a lot of volcano exploration. I've never actually been scuba diving or, or in a submarine at an underwater volcano, but there was a volcano in the South Pacific called Hunga Ha'apai. It's a very hard name to say. Um, in the island nation of Tonga. And it was an undersea volcano that kept erupting and erupting and erupting until it broke th the surface of the water and created a brand new island. I was already in New Zealand um, filming for my Angry Planet TV show, and we decided to go to Tonga to go and check out this brand new volcanic island. So we found a fishing boat. We hired a, this captain to take us out there, and we it, the water was so rough. The sea was just crazy. We couldn't land the boat on this new volcanic island, so I had to jump in the water and swim to shore. And my TV producer came with me, 
And when we got to this brand new volcanic island, I was able to stand on it. It was so fresh and so new that it was still warm. I would put my hand on the ground and it was still warm, like fresh baked bread right out of the oven. And <laughs> here's the funny part was in all the confusion of swimming from the boat to the volcano, one of my bags got flooded with water and ended up back at the boat. So here I am, we have to film a TV program, and my clothes and my cameras are still back on the boat. We've got one camera that we can use, and all I have to wear now is my life jacket, my sandals, and my underwear. So we spent the next few hours walking around this brand new volcano, the newest island in the world, and I was talking to the camera, doing hosting the television program, just wearing my underwear. So that was pretty funny. If uh, if the volcano had erupted again with us standing on it, that would have been pretty bad because it had lots of big explosive eruptions. And there was a crater in the middle that was filled with rainwater. So there was a lake that was steaming. The water was scalding hot to touch. It was still quite active but wasn't exploding at that time. So we spent a few hours there and then swam back to the boat. It's a little scary because when we left, it was sunset. And that's when sharks like to come out to feed. And when you're swimming from an active volcano to a boat through shark-infested waters in the South Pacific, it's pretty scary. Oh, thank you. That's thank great. you so much. Thank you. How about uh, Mrs. Diesel's class? Do you guys have another question? Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, we have to go. I think we had to go. So what about uh, maybe if we, if anyone wants maybe Mrs. O'Neill's class in Texas, if you guys got uh, another question. Let's see here. Hang on. Oops, sorry. Okay, you're, oh, you're live. We have a ton more questions, but we have to go. So we're going to say bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey, it looks like that's uh, the questions for today. Maybe if you guys want, you can say goodbye to George and thank George for his uh, his wonderful talk today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You're awesome. Wonderful. Okay, that was this installment of Exploring by the Cedar Pants. Um, it was a fantastic talk with uh, adventure and explorer George Karunas, and we look forward to uh, seeing some future talks from you uh, uh, again. Thanks, Always George. a pleasure. Cheers. Thanks.